As you can see today, we have some opportunity to listen to our professor visiting our faculty. So on behalf of our faculty and also other organization that is Polish Economic Association, I would like to welcome you here. And we have with us Professor Harris. Some of you already know him. And so they will listen to his lecture, open lecture, on the topic that you can see. So first, listen carefully. And then I hope that we'll have some short discussion. Uh, I hope you will enjoy the lecture. And I think that we can start. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm glad to be, be here. Um, obviously, I'm Dr. Harris. And uh, want to talk about today what I call information technology and its impact on ethics and privacy. Um, I'm really going to introduce the subject. I will talk about an ethical framework just to kind of give us some, some uh, something to think about. Then I'm going to hit some what I call ethical privacy dilemmas that have been caused by information technology. I'm going to have some late trends that are coming in that really are impacting the world today and hopefully a conclusion or two as we go along. What is a dilemma? Now, I wanted, since I'm talking to a Polish audience, I want everybody to understand what is a dilemma. Does anybody know what a dilemma is? A dilemma? Basically, it's a difficult situation or a difficult problem. In other words, it puts us in a situation where we have to choose one of two ways, more or less, to do what we're doing. And that's really what information technology is doing to a lot of things in the world. Uh, I have what I call axioms, or things that I think are true. I can't prove it per se, but I think really it is true. My first one is every major advancement in information technology is accompanied by at least one ethical or privacy uh, dilemma. Every time we, we introduce new technology, something pops up that makes us say, uh-oh, there's a potential problem as far as I'm concerned. So that's the first. The next one says computer users are usually unaware of that balance between information technology and the ethics and privacy impacts. Actually, most students don't even think about it. I think uh, as you get older, you think about it a little more, but most students don't even think about that. But there is. And the third one I throw out is businesses have a difficult time balancing their need for data with users' needs for privacy. And that in itself is an ethical dilemma. Businesses want more and more and more data. They are intruding on your privacy, I can guarantee it. And most of you don't even realize it. And that's kind of what, the, uh, what part of the problem is. Now I like to uh, start out by just kind of, let's talk about uh, the legal, the moral, and the ethical. Just so we got some, have some idea of what the differences are. Um, legal. I hope everybody can agree, legal basically is conformity uh, with, with law. Usually something is either legal or illegal. If it's illegal, it's pretty much a crime. So I'm not gonna get too much into that. However, the moral starts popping in as the next level. It's concerned with the judgment, uh, as I said, of goodness or badness in some action. Now, morality differs between cultures, differs between people, differs between countries. So what uh, some people may say is very moral, others would not agree. It's not. So it, we've got to give a little leadway. Usually, when we talk about moral, we're talking about uh, legal. So if it's legal, is it moral or immoral? Is it ethical or unethical? Now that's a little different than moral because basically it's accepted principles of uh, the right or wrong, 
based upon your culture. And any two people can look at each other and see, see differences. I might think that's not really ethical. Why did you ask me to do that? You would, obviously you thought it was. So we have a little difference of opinion at that point in the game. So this is what starts throwing us. And finally, there's that, then that ethical dilemma. A complex situation that often involves a, a mental conflict between moral imperatives in which to obey one might result in, in, in uh, uh, transgressing another. The ethical paradox. And that's kind of what we talk. As, we, as I go along, you, I hope you'll see how these, kind of, these work into technology and its impacts on today. I like to do a framework when, before we start. It's, called, it's from uh, Mason. It's about 30 years old. But it's called PAPA. And that's the four letters of the four words that, that, I, that I'll start by talking about. Privacy. And I'll ask questions kind of, what information about oneself must a person reveal to others? Well, makes it interesting. Under what circumstances or conditions and with what safeguards? When you walk into a bank and open a checking account or an account with the bank, you give the bank certain information. You are basically saying, I, I expect you to keep this information private. Now, some people may not really have that, but that's what I would say. You, you expect, I expect you to safeguard it, not let anybody steal it and use it for other, other means. So the whole concept of privacy uh, is one that, uh, well, we all have a little different ways of looking at it. But when I get into the information technology, you're going to see, oops, it kind of, it kind of uh, uh, gets, goes against our privacy thoughts. The second one is accuracy. Who's responsible for, keep, for keeping the data about you safe? Accurate. How do you know what people collect about you is correct? Now, if it's the bank and you told them you live in one place and you move to another, what would you do? Hopefully you go to the bank and say, you need to change my address. And that's exactly kind of the thing that, that you do, accuracy. However, you will find out that en enough companies keep data about you and do they really worry about the accuracy? I would say not really. So it's something you need to think about. The third one is property. Who owns data? Especially data about you. Who owns it? When you give all that data to the bank, is it still yours or does the bank use it? I would probably say in today's world, the bank probably uses it. Did you give them permission? Well, there's a little difference in the EU and in the United States about, about some of those kinds of things. Because for the most part in the EU, you have to opt in, say yes. In the United States, you do not. Once they have it, they can use it about any way they want unless you tell them specifically, I don't want you using that data. So the, the property, whose property is the data about you? And finally, accessibility. What data does a person have the right or privilege to obtain and under what circumstances? Who has data about you? And technology is all about data in today's world. It really is. So looking at the PAPA, it gives us kind of a framework to look at these. What I do now is I, ha I have 19 areas that I want to talk about. Actually, there's a couple more after the, the, the final ones. But 19 areas that I want to talk about. And I'm not going to talk about them in some of them in great detail. But there, there are 19 different places, things that I think are worthy. And IT really impacts both the property and 
ethics. So consequently, okay. Email, search monitoring the workplace. So this is very kind of a, a, an interesting issue in the United States. Looking, can your employer look at your emails? Can your employer look at who you have visited on the web? A lot of students kind of look, well, no. But what does the employer say? That's my computer, and anything you put in it is my data. I know of several in the United States. I haven't really looked in Europe per se, but I know several instances in the United States where uh, employees have uh, used either sent emails or surfed the web, and once the, the employer found out, the worst they say might walk up and say, you're fired. That's something our company does not want you to do. We don't respect that. But I was doing it on my break. You were using my computers. You were using my property. That's what the employer would come back and say. Now, I put on all these, what is it, the dilemma, should they be able to monitor? I put the issues, sometimes is it privacy, sometimes is it ethics, sometimes is it both. And then I throw that morality down there. Everybody for yourself has to kind of say where that fits on that line, each one of them. Uh, students are very, in the United States, are sometimes very surprised that employers check your emails, they look at what you've surfed, and if it's not within their standards, they will, well, they'll, they'll, they'll punish you or fire you. And in the United States, that's held up pretty, pretty good. So we've got a, a little dilemma right there as to, to, to should they be able to do that or not. How about personal devices? Well, now you're, you're having a little different one. Looking at emails, search sites, GPS data that comes from personal devices owned by a citizen. You walk into my store and I have the capability to, to basically sense that you have a phone on. It has GPS on that phone. Now I have GPS of where you are. You're in my store and I can use that information to do many things. I could send you a, a, immediately a, a, an ad that says, buy something in my store and you get 10% you get off. And all of a sudden your phone rings, you pick it up, oh, okay, here, I'll show it. What have you given up for them to do that? Your privacy? They know you're there? Nowadays you can walk down a sidewalk and they can, they can basically tell your GPS that you, who you are and phone you immediately while you're still on the sidewalk and said, come in my store and get 10% off anything you want. So you turn in the store. But what have you done to your privacy? What, is that ethical? So I think there's an interesting one when you start, especially when you start looking at personal devices. Everybody in here probably has a smartphone. Well, I don't own me, but uh, everybody else uh, over there probably has a smartphone. And do you know if the GPS is turned on or off? It's probably turned on. Do you know people can intercept that and basically have data about you? Something most people don't know. Uh, email spam. Now, that's not quite as a big of a problem in the EU as it is in the United States, because in the EU, if an EU member cannot send spam to other EU members unless, they have, unless you opt in, in the United States, it's no such thing. So I don't know how many of you get uh, spam that is uh, basically uh, some kind of advertising for the most part wanting you to do something, and I'm not talking right now about phishing, I'm talking about just pure advertising coming to you. Uh, you get a lot of them from the United States, I can tell you that right now. 
Because, well, why? Because uh, the, the people doing this do it from the United States because they're not subject to the EU laws. Or from Russia, or from other non-EU countries. So, so the whole concept of spam is one that, that technology has, has brought to us. And uh, I don't know how many, but I get, I get literally many, many, many spam, what I call spam messages every day. Data access, uh, accessing or looking at data that you're not authorized to. Uh, unfortunately, the, the technology is allowing people to start doing that now. Um, we're not authorized necessarily to see. We're not taking anything. We're not stealing things. We're just looking. An example I always use is you're at, you're at your office and you want to find out if, uh, uh, if the coworker is getting paid more than you are. A lot of times, uh, you, the females will say, is my, are my male workers getting paid more than I am? So you'll figure out how to get in and, and, and check and see, oh, okay, what's their pay? Oh, nope, they're not, okay. Have I done anything wrong? That'd be, that'd be an interesting question to ask half of you. Have they done anything wrong? They haven't done it, they haven't used it, they just checked on it. So that's kind of a, an interesting one. Monitoring. Nowadays, unfortunately, thanks to technology, companies are monitoring their employees. You have a company car, guess what? The car has GPS, guess what? They know where you are at all times. They know you've gone to, to a particular place. They know how long you've been there. It's kind of, they're, they're collecting data about what you do, many times without even telling you. So now, again, we have a privacy and we have a, 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 a big problem because they're checking up on you. And some people would say whether they tell you or not makes no difference, but that's still what we're, we're looking for. How about phishing? Everybody understand the word phishing? That means you get a, a, a uh, email or something that uh, supposedly is from a legitimate source that wants you to divulge or give them some information that will help them basically steal your identity. I hope you're, you're always on the, out, on the lookout for, for these things. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a problem. It's a major, major, major problem. And thanks to the technology, uh, we seem to be getting more and more and more and more. My university went to Google about a year ago, so we used the Google email service, which has that little spam folder. And I go in there, and in a week, I'll get about 200 in there. That means people are trying to, to, to have me open something so they could uh, tell me that my bank needs uh, my, my uh, password. No, my bank doesn't. They need the password so that they can go into your bank. And that's exactly what they're doing. Another example of how technology is really invading your privacy and really invading uh, so from an ethical standpoint. Cyberbullying. This is, a, this is becoming actually a, a problem in some parts of the United States. Um, hopefully not too much at the university level, but it's even becoming a problem at the lower level. It used to be the, the big boy at, at, at the school bullied by just saying, I'll beat you up or I'll steal your money. Nowadays, they come at it through the internet, through Facebook, through other social media. And it's really interesting to see some of, some of the things that are, that, that are coming along on that. Uh, data accumulation, other people know it as big data. Extremely large data sets that may be uh, analyzed to reveal patterns, trends, and association. Uh, <clears throat> I put a lot of them about uh, what's being caught in the big data area. Uh, every web page you, you visit, Google probably has a record of it, or whoever, whichever uh, 
search engine you use. They keep a record of it. Security cameras take your picture all over the place. Uh, I, I've, I've heard the tale, and I, I think it's true, that in one large European city, if you spend the day just uh, looking around at all the sites, your pack picture will be taken about 200 times a day. It will then be bounced against a database. Very specifically, they're looking for things that would uh, uh, catch uh, criminals or terrorists for those sorts of things. But once they identify you, they basically know where you've been, every place you've stopped. You, in effect, give away your personal privacy by them doing that. Uh, what other the security can data aggregators? I'll talk about that later. Insurers are collecting data about you. Online retailers, every time you go to Amazon, now I'm not sure which of the big ones over here are, but for us, every time you go to Amazon, they know, they know what you've looked at. And in fact, they'll use that for whenever you, you log on something else, say Yahoo, guess what? You'll see the ads of what? Just what you looked up. At least I do. Now, that's kind of scary sometimes, especially if I say, I've, I've already bought that. Why, why are they showing me that? Because they don't know you've showed it, but they know you've looked at it. They have the capability to basically follow your every move. And I think that's, that, that's a real interesting thing when you think about it. Uh, every app on your smartphone collects data. Every app. Every time you click it, they're, 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 they're collecting data about you. They're collecting data where you are. They're collecting data about what you're looking at. Next time you go on, guess what? You'll get ads on that about what you looked at. You'll get ads about something else. So there's accumulation, there's, a, there's the, 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 the accumulation of data by many, many, many companies that you don't even know they're accumulating data about you. But they are. That's how you get, if you've ever seen ads that, uh, gosh, I just looked at this this week or last week. That's how they know. They're collecting that kind of stuff. Big data is a, a real interesting uh, technology right now, and you're going to see more and more and more about that. Uh, data accuracy, data security. Uh, how do you know that, that, that things, everything's accurate? Actually, I'll talk about uh, data aggregators a little bit. Uh, in the United States, there's quite a few of them, and they try to collect every piece of data they can about you. They know where you live. They know how much you paid for your house. They know if you've had a parking ticket or not. They know if you've been arrested. They know if you've, how, how much you pay in taxes. They know uh, uh, all these kinds of things. And the scary thing is every once in a while you get something that had no relation to you. Oh, but it's, it's about a, somebody who has the same name as you. So that got associated with you. How can you change it? Well, I'll tell you, that's, that, that's about like going outside and trying to move the elephant. It's very, very, very difficult. So that whole accuracy, security kind of thing is really a problem. Filtering. I don't know if you realize it, but many, many of the, of the search uh, uh, engines will filter what you see, sometimes based on your past actions. Now, this is, this is a, a real problem in communist or what I call dic uh, dictator regimes, uh, China, they do a lot of filtering. Uh, people used to say the three T's. You didn't try to find anything about Taiwan, Tiananmen Square, or Tibet. Because if you do, it'll come back and say, we don't have any, we don't know about that. 
And in fact, uh, I just recently saw an interesting one about all the things that are filtered and in, in China. Some, some of them are quite ridiculous as far as I'm concerned, but not to the Chinese. And obviously, if you're in any kind of dictatorial company, uh, a country, excuse me, they will filter what you see. They don't want you knowing the truth. So by using technology, it's kind of interesting. They can limit and actually push what they want you to see, which becomes quite, quite an interesting, uh, I think, privacy and ethical kind of a situation. Intellectual property. I've got two or three about intellectual property. The first one is plagiarism. Um, university students are, have, have a lot of, ought to have a lot of interest in, in this one because they, they do it more than I, I would like to see sometimes. Um, I've had many years of, uh, I've been at my university 28 years, and every once in a while I would pick up a, a paper by a student and look and I'd say, I've read that before. And I go out and I find the exact two-page paper somewhere out on the internet. They, you can only do that because of technology. You can. You, you have to watch out, though. Uh, it is a problem that one that because of technology, you used to have to go into the library and actually find something called a book. And if you wanted to plagiarize, you had to copy it. Now you don't. You just copy and paste. Copy and paste. Makes it kind of interesting. Uh, music downloading. Some of you... Some of you um, uh, have probably down. If I if I really found out how many of you have downloaded songs off the internet, probably a lot of you was smiling. I see and say, yeah, I've probably done that. Uh, uh, but only from technology. <laughs> it's not something that you want to do, and that it, it, it has a real interesting thing as far as I'm concerned. The ethics problem, software piracy. <laughs> Uh, using software that uh, you haven't paid for and isn't yours. And in fact, the, the, everybody heard of the, the, the WannaCry crisis? <coughs> Happened last week. It hit the whole, basically the whole world. <coughs> and ransomware, they were able to put it out, encrypt your data, and said, basically, from what I saw, pay $300 and you can get your data back. By the way, you have two days to do this, otherwise it, it, it goes to $600. So it is kind of interesting. Why did that work? One of the reasons is it worked mostly, if you, if you read about it, it worked mostly on computers that had pirated software. Pirated software. Why? Because Windows updates uh, uh, legal software quite often. And actually, they updated in March the problem that would have caught this. So if you were running a computer using Windows software that was pirated, you have not, don't have the update, and you could have probably well gotten caught. If you look at it, what happens is most of the time, most of the time, uh, those are the people that got in a problem with this WannaCry want uh, outbreak were, were machines that had illegal or pirated software. So be very careful from the ethical standpoint and basically uh, as far as that. How about reverse engineering? Everybody understand that? That's where you take something and you take it apart to see how it was built and then you are able to build it back. And then you're able to build it back. Unfortunately, China for many years was a real problem there. They would get technology and they would reverse engineer it and they would turn around and then sell it. Almost the exact same product for a lot cheaper. In fact, it was so bad that there was one example. Oh, thank you. 
it was so bad that there was one example where for a router, they reverse engineered uh, another company's router, they sold it, and later on found out it had the same software error as the original, which you could only do by reverse engineering. So computers have allowed us to do reverse engineering quite well and quite easily. Viruses and worms. Um, computer programs that can spread. Now, I'm not going to get into how or which what the difference is, but it can spread to one to another and many times cause serious harm. Um, people do it all, all the time. Now, most of the people who do this are in the uh, illegal side of the house. But we have to be aware, and it's only since we started using the, the internet and those sorts of things, it's only since we started doing that that uh, the, the viruses and the worms have, have uh, shown up in the world. So I think that's, that's an interesting one, both from a privacy and from an ethics standpoint. Computer activity that hurts no one but the user. And this is somewhat uh, uh, an activity that's uh, somehow banned, might be legal, might consider it immoral, might be because of religion or anything else, but it hurts no one but the user. In other words, it's not hurting anyone else. Why should I not be able to go online and uh, gamble, even though it's illegal? Good question. Because it is illegal, I would guess, but uh, it, it, it causes some real problem, and I think it's really, really something that, that people need to be aware of that hurts nobody but the person. Uh, the whole concept of cybercrime, any crime that involves a computer network or other information technologies, and this goes back to the cyberbullying, it goes back to a lot of them, but there's a lot of cybercrime out there now. Uh, only because of the internet, only because of technology, only because you're connected can they do it. What happens if they send you a phishing uh, request and you accidentally open it, I put malware on your machine, I now can look at what you're doing, I can now have it call back to me, I can now have, know all these kinds of things. So consequently, uh, this whole cybercrime area, and again, I'm not getting into, into great detail, I'm just saying this is one of the, unfortunately, one of the impacts of technology in today's world, uh, cybercrime. Cyberterrorism is another one, and we're having a lot of that now, aren't we? The intentional use of computers uh, to cause severe disruption, widespread fear of society. Most of you probably don't know of or have heard of what uh, about several years, of, years ago, there was a uh, cyber terrorism attack on Estonia and basically brought down the Esto whole Estonia economy for a while. This is becoming more and more prevalent in today's world. The whole concept of cyber, of cyber terrorism. What, how can we use the internet to strike fear in people? I keep, uh, people keep asking me, my wife and I do a lot of traveling and every once in a while they say, well, well aren't, you, aren't you afraid of traveling? Gee, what happens if something goes wrong? And we keep saying, then they've won. No, we're not afraid of it. We're not gonna run away from it but we keep a diligent eye the best we can. And I think that's, that, that's a good way to put it. Okay, late trends. Social networking, boy, I, I, can, I can talk all day to, to students about social networking. Uh, online services, platform sites, uh, Facebook is probably the biggest one that uh, basically allow you to share uh, interest, life uh, connections and that sort of thing. It has brought a number of what I call problems, increased advertising. 
Are you seeing more and more advertising on your, when you get on Facebook? The answer is probably yes. Are you seeing advertising of things you've looked for late, lately? Ooh, even on other websites? Yes. How do they do that? Well, because they're keeping data about you. They know where you've been. They know what, what uh, uh, products you've looked at. What products you've looked at even. What about control of security? That's always been a big one. A lot of people don't like Facebook. They say, but Facebook doesn't let us uh, control our security very well at all. Is that something they should let you do or not? So that's the whole question. Uh, how about the concept of tagging in Facebook? Everybody understand tagging? I find your picture in there and I click and I, I, I put your name. Now, what does that do? I'll, I'll talk about that later, but uh, Facebook has a great, very, very good facial recognition capability. And once they do that, tag you to your face, what can they do next? And I keep asking in my classes, I keep asking students, okay, what do you think if Facebook decided you've been tagged, they know who you are? What if they decided to scan every picture uploaded, especially I'll say in, 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 in your area, every picture uploaded from somebody in Poznan looking for you? And they started finding you, oh, somebody took a picture of you at, at this party or at that party. And now they know what you're doing. Now they, could, they can tag you. Is that, is that ethical? Should that be done? My students start saying no. Okay, well, you know what? If they've got that facial recognition capability, what if they want, went on the entire internet and started looking at every picture on the internet for you? Now they, they start capturing you, not in the Facebook phase or time, but every other time you've taken a picture and uploaded it to any media. Is that ethical? Would you like them to do that to you? That's the kind of thing, that's the latest trends, that's the latest thing social networking is starting to do. Not only to find out where you are on their site, but where you are out there in the cyber world. And they can actually go find any of them. That's, that's not a big thing. The next uh, trend is GPS tracking. And I talked about it on some others, but th this is becoming quite interesting now. Tracking individuals. Uh, most automobiles now, automobiles, there's an interesting one. Um, they are putting basically a computer in most automobiles that uh, record all the data of your driving. Where you've been, how fast you've gone, how hard you're braking. They can da that data can be downloaded about any time. So, you're in an accident? Oh, gosh, you were, you were speeding. You were going five miles over the speed limit. But, oh, how do you know? Because <laughs> we can find out. We can find out. I've already said your, your phones, your smartphones, actually give, can give away a lot of information about you, where you've been. So be a little careful. In fact, a lot of parents are now starting to do that with, uh, I'll say, their uh, teenage. Oh, you're 16 or 17 or whatever it takes to drive? Okay, but then I can go find out where you went. What's the ethics and privacy implications of those kinds of things? So GPS tracking, start uh, thinking and understanding what's happening when they start talking about GPS tracking. When you start getting these neat, neat toys, I call them toys, technologies 
that had GPS as part of them. You are basically giving away your right of privacy. Facial recognition, I talked about that already a little bit, a little bit. Uh, biometric method of identifying you, uh, it's now being used by governments, online companies. In fact, uh, actually just today I was, I was watching a, a, a television and they were saying Delta Airlines is going to allow Americans, I guess over here maybe, I don't know when they'll use it, to walk up with their suitcases and use facial recognition to allow flyers to check their bags, pay and check their bags. Now they know you, literally. The whole concept of facial recognition is being expanded greatly. It gives you, it, it takes complete, your privacy completely away. Walk down the street and somebody's taking your picture. So think about that when you're, when you're looking at, uh, when you're doing things, when you're walking around, when you're doing those. Uh, I call it data aggregation. Uh, basically, it's a collection about as, uh, as much data about you as can be collected, sometimes by source, sometimes by subject, and the resale of that data to companies, governments, and individuals. There are quite a few companies now who do nothing but go out and, and harvest data, harvest data about you. It's collected about you, and you don't know it. Credit bureaus, every time in the United States there are three major credit bureaus, uh, they're collecting data about you. Uh, news aggregators, I, I, I put uh, oh, web usage aggregators, Google's probably the biggest. Every time you click using Google, they know it. And they're keeping data about it. Oh. You didn't, well, yes, you did say yes, that they can do that. Maybe you didn't realize it, but once you did, you're doing those kinds of things. How do you know everything is accurate? What if somebody else logs on uh, with, you let somebody else log on, and they go to some other site that you would never go to, but now guess who gets, guess who they know did it? You. So technology has really made it kind of, kind of do. Uh, am I scaring you a little bit? I hope so, because I think that's really more or less what's happening in the world. Um, I found this one, and I thought it was pretty good. That what I call the what they call the Ten Commandments of Computer Ethics, Ethics and Privacy. Um, I'm going to highlight them. You can read them. That's one good thing about I try to do when I come to another country like Poland. If you can read it and listen to it at the same time, hopefully that, that, that helps you learn English and, and be a little better at it. Thou shalt not use a computer to harm other people, not interfere with other, compu other people's computer work, snoop around in other people's files. Ooh, that's what we've been talking about. Not use computer to steal. Well, that's part of them too, isn't it? Not use computer to tell lies. Well, I've got to tell our, our president about that one. Uh, not copy or use proprietary software which you've not paid for. That'll run you into problems too. Uh, shall not use other people's computer resources without authorization or proper compensation. In other words, you can't steal computer time. Shall not appropriate other people's intellectual property. Hmm, I talked about that a little bit, didn't I? Let's see. So not think about social course, uh, think about the social consequences of the programs that you use. You will think about those. I hope so. All you Facebook users, that's an interesting one to think about. Uh, always use a computer in ways that ensure consideration and respect for your fellow humans. Um, I guess the, 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 the biggest message I have, or several one of, 
Technology has introduced many dilemmas for users. I've looked at 19 of them, plus a few uh, extras, and plus some late trending issues for you to think about. How is it impacting you? Culture plays an important part in the whole ethics privacy debate concern uh, regarding information technology. What's, what's uh, moral and ethical in some cultures may not be in others. And if you're gonna live in a worldwide society, you, have, you better understand the differing cultures, ethics, and security concerns, especially of others. And so, so I've kind of tried to walk you through a lot of different thoughts and ideas on information technology and ethics and security. Or privacy, I guess, excuse me, ethics and privacy. I, I hope it's, uh, you've, you've learned a little bit from it and what the impacts could be to you. And you guys are just starting, so I think it'll be an interesting journey for you from here on.